Let me just pray for a moment. Father, this morning, as we look at this text in Romans 12, I pray that you would open it up for us. As we start a new sermon series on what it means to be a church in this community, I pray that you'd open that up for us. And that's so much more than just ideas that come from me that you would inspire our hearts to be everything that you called us to be, to be your witnesses, to be your disciples. Uh, We're not in Judea or Samaria, but we are at the ends of the earth. And here we are in West Michigan, uh, somewhere that the disciples of Jesus never even dreamed or thought or knew about. But here we are. Um, Here we are, Lord, with people all around us that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And we need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ from each other. So I pray that you would equip us by your spirit to understand scripture deeper and fuller and be equipped as the body, as the physical body of Jesus Christ, as individuals who are Jesus Christ to the people around us. And so you would uh, fill us up every moment to help us be more godlike, to be more godly, to be more holy, to be more empowered. So by your spirit, through fruit and gifts, people around us would be equipped. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Over the last maybe four months, um, I've had quite a few conversations uh, with people in church, and because of those conversations, I've been inspired, uh, led, felt led to preach another sermon series really on the vision of this church, which is to be a community church. We have an official vision statement, and I'll share it in a minute. But really behind that vision statement is what it takes to be a community church. Some of you who were here uh, maybe about four years ago in September of 2011 know that I preached a series of four sermons on sort of the planks or the foundation of what it means to be a church. And at that time, I was going through a difficult time. The church was going through a difficult time. But I knew without a shadow of a doubt that if a church responds and understands what it is, that God will use that church to do what he's called that church to do. And so I had four uh, boards laying around in the backyard, and I put some signs on them. And uh, I have a picture of one of them. And this is, this will tell you how long it is ago. Uh, this is the first sermon I preach. It's the last sermon I'm going to preach in this sermon here. Lost people matter. And that's Elias, uh, looking a little bit younger and sitting up. He was laying down on the couch, just sitting up. His son was still ready to suck because he did that back then. And lost people matter. And so that's where we're going to end. Um, but where we're going to begin is another one of these sermons, which is the power of community. And I took those boards and made a treehouse out of them, so I had to get some new ones. But this is uh, the power of community. So over the next weeks, we're going to have maybe three or four uh, more of these boards. And we're going to talk about the planks of what it means to be a community church. This week is the power of community, or as you may see on the slide, the power of hospitality. But I'll get to that. And so our official vision statement is really this, experiencing God together, being transformed by his power to love God and love people. And that's an awesome, awesome statement. But often when I'm explaining explaining what it means to particular people about what is behind this, it's really that uh, this church decided four or five years ago that we want to be a church for our community. And by the grace of God, that's happened. But at this time, I want to go back and sort of have a a sermon series on the vision of church and, and what's involved on the ground level. I've grown in the last three or four years, and I realize there's a couple things that are involved with that. That's why next week we're going to talk about conflict and a few more things. But this week we're going to talk about the power of hospitality, the power of community from Romans 12, verses 4 through 13. And this morning, Janet Weed is going to read that text for us and invite you to open your Bibles to that as well. Sorry, let me get a mic. (laughs) Okay, Romans 12, verses 4 to 13 is found on page 1188 in your pew Bibles. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. 
If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in 817, actually, 1794, a man named Eli Whitney went in front of Congress with 10 muskets, and he disassembled them completely, set them all the parts out on the table, and then he reassembled them using the various parts from each gun to put each musket back together again. Now today that wouldn't be that big of a deal, but back in, in 1794, whatever date that was, it was a huge deal because every single musket, every single anything that was put together was handcrafted, and we didn't have this concept of interchangeable parts that we do today. What he was introducing was interchangeable parts, so that back in the Civil War, in the 1860s, this gun, which was made by Springfield, was made such that every single part on this is interchangeable. This, in fact, is a Civil War era gun. It belongs to um, Bill Heising. He uh, is somewhat of a Civil War aficionado. And uh, this is what they used to uh, wreak havoc in our country back then. And you know, uh, I was thinking about this whole idea of interchangeable parts, and perhaps it would have been good if they hadn't developed this idea of interchangeable parts quite so fast, because it allowed for incredible efficiency in this. You could take this part, this gun apart, and find guns from a certain area, and put it back together, and it would, in fact, uh, work. If you want to see this afterwards, you can take a look at it. It's quite the piece of work. So the idea of interchangeable parts is really so ubiquitous today that it really has made our entire society possible. You know that if you get a case online for your phone, it's going to fit your phone. At least it should if you didn't pay like $2 for it. And it'll fit your phone exactly because everything is made according to certain specifications. You know that if you work in a factory, there's people with, that work in quality control, right? And they run around with little calipers and they measure everything. And certain, if certain things are out of tolerance, that means that it's not going to be available to sell. You've got to do something different to your manufacturing process. Interchangeable parts really is the foundation of our modern industrial society. Society. However, there's something that's pretty important to think about in terms of how we function as a church. Because it's tempting to believe that churches themselves and even Christians are interchangeable parts. So when we think about us as a church, we think, well, maybe we should do the program that the church down the street has, or maybe we should be like that church, or maybe we should be like this church. And the fact of the matter is that churches and human beings are not interchangeable parts. We are fearfully and wonderfully made individually. And churches are fearfully and wonderfully made individually. And the power of this, in, and power of this is in realizing, um, especially three or four years ago when I preached this the first time, it don't matter where a particular church is and how grand it is or how small it is, how struggling it is or how equipped it is. The fact of the matter is that God has called each church individually to be a witness and a light in its particular community. And that uniqueness, that differentness, is an incredible asset instead of a liability as we as a church seek to be a witness in our particular community. And that's reflected in the text. It's reflected right in the text this morning about people. And as you see, um, well, that's a diagram of all the many, many parts that are involved in making a gun. So in Romans chapter 12, it says this. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. 
If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So each one of us as individuals have been given different gifts. And I think our tendency, all of our tendency, is to look at other people around us and go, well, man, they're so good at that, and they're so good at this, and I'm just really not that good at anything. But God has called us each individually, and we're called to seek that out and to discover that as people. Here's a list from this particular verse. Prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement, contributing, leadership, and mercy. And then here's a, a longer list from the New Testament, all the gifts. Now, I don't teach on gifts every week, so I'll just hit this briefly. How does a spiritual gift work? Is it a natural talent? Is it a spiritual gift that God just imputes in our lives? In college, when I first learned about this, I spent a lot of time thinking about this interplay between natural gifts and spiritual gifts. And uh, now, maybe 20 years later, I've realized there's a, there's a different ways this spiritual gifting works. Sometimes God takes a natural talent that we're really uh, naturally gifted at, and he turns it into a spiritual gift, and it becomes uh, centered, focused, equipped by the Spirit to do something that um, you couldn't otherwise do with just a natural talent. An example of this is John Ortberg. Uh, John Ortberg is a preacher. You maybe heard of him. He wrote things like, if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. So it turns out John Ortberg is a naturally gifted communicator. But as he's been equipped by the Spirit of God to have a spiritual gift of teaching and preaching, that gift has been equipped in a whole new way to do things that John in an old self could never do. On the other hand, sometimes people get a spiritual gift that really is not at all related to any sort of natural gifts they have. Uh, sometimes people get this with mercy. Now, I'm merciful in some ways, but in some ways... Um, I'm not, and that's kind of a weird thing to say as a pastor, but I don't always have compassion for things right off the bat that my wife does. My wife has mercy gifts in other areas, but sometimes by the Spirit of God, I look at or hear about a particular situation, I'm just overwhelmed with emotion, and actually probably cry about it sometimes, although I probably shouldn't admit that either because I'm a strong man, right? Um, but God equips us with mercy gifts, and I think... Um, these spiritual gifts interact with our natural gifts in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's probably 80% natural and the Spirit comes in. Sometimes he gives us gifts that we never would have ever seen coming. An example, uh, if I can share this, I didn't ask them, but Bill and uh, Pat Heising. And Pat has said many times she's totally surprised at being an elder because that would have never been something she saw coming when she was 25 or 30 or 40 or 50. And here she is uh, leading as an elder in, uh, in our church. So the Spirit does different things and interacts different ways with these spiritual gifts. But the point this morning is that each one of us is equipped differently. We're not all the same. I have another point here. Hit me with a new slide there, uh, Linda. It's not working for me. And give me one more. All right. So how, why, why is this? It's because of this. Various gifts are needed for various people. And here's where I want to talk a little bit about my role as a pastor. It turns out that I can't do everything. Now, you guys knew that. <laughs> Marcia knew it. Um, but it's not something that I always know, uh, that I can't do everything. It turns out I can do a lot of diff different things. I have gifts in a lot of different areas. But I can't, I can't do everything. Um, in particular, I can't interact with every single person that comes into church in a way that's helpful for them. And hopefully it's not unhelpful, but um, I can't interact with everybody in a way that I'd like to. A great example is at the Wednesday night dinner, there's a guy uh, who comes for a long time, and I tried to talk to him, but every time I talked to him, I got about nowhere, right? And some of us, I do this sometimes, we all do this sometimes, but I said, hey, how you doing? Is it good? So, did you have a good week? Yep. These are your kids? Uh-huh. I'm, I'm getting nowhere. Like, I just have no idea how to relate to them. But it turns... Uh, i got to stop saying that. It turns out. So, a couple weeks later, uh, John and his wife, Heather, sit down at uh, the Wednesday night dinner and say, sit down and talk to him. And it turns out John and Heather have this great relationship with this guy now, and they totally, he totally opened up to them. And there's so many examples of that where I can't quite relate to people like I want to, like I feel I should. And then later, someone else comes and relates to them in a wonderfully way, wonderful way that is uh, 
quite miraculous. Sarah is another person I was at um, Anchor Point this week, and Sarah was talking to someone who comes here once in a while. I just walked right by them because Sarah was connecting with this person in a way that I, I really never could. There's people around you in your life that need things, that are asking for things, that have a heart's cry for things, and it could be that you have the unique gifts that are required to reach out to that person. That's why God has gifted you to do that particular way. And this may be in development for quite some time. Carrie and David are in Uganda now. And Carrie's been thinking about and trained for uh, being a speech therapist for a long time. And probably thought she was going to end up with some nice practice here in North America. And she may well come back someday. But as God had it uh, planned out, she's out in Uganda teaching people and really equipping other people to be speech therapists in ways that she never would have dreamed of. God has given her unique gifts, and now she gets to step into those unique gifts. Um, people have unique needs, and we are called to serve those people with our unique gifts. It turns out our church is uniquely gifted too. Every church has a different character, and I've been seeing this more and more as I've been the pastor of a church longer and longer. Uh, different churches have very different gifts, and that's why it's really important as a church not just to do the thing that the church down the road is doing. As I think about our church, there's probably many different ways we're gifted, but if I had to describe one way that we're gifted that is unique and really very unique, I would simply say it as this. We have a gift of hospitality. And that gift of hospitality gets worked out like this. You are very good at welcoming people in church regardless of their background or circumstances, whether things have gone really well for them or whether things have been really, really difficult for them. And so many of you who are now part of church have said, when I came to Calvary, I felt welcomed in ways that were really remarkable. Some of us come to church wondering if we're going to be welcome, if we've done things that sort of put us outside of the possibility of being part of church. Some of us come to church, we don't really think that. We think, are people actually going to talk to me? Are people going to welcome me? But over the last three or four years, at the Wednesday night dinner, at the food truck, but especially here on Sunday morning, you guys have done an amazing job of opening up your lives and your hearts to people, even when some of the people that have visited haven't exactly fit the regular standard of what it means to be a church member. So God has called us in unique and powerful ways. And um, this isn't always a message that is uh, well known in broader culture. I think if you've grown up in church, you've heard this a lot, that God has called you, uniquely gifted, and he wants you to do things. But I had the privilege of talking to an older gentleman this week who um, I've talked to him maybe three weeks ago, and then he came back in this week. And this is an older gentleman. He really hasn't been part of church for most of his life. And, but he's really compelling. He's really he got a great personality, able to talk to a lot of people. And more importantly, God's spirit is moving in him in a huge way, just opening up his mind to the possibilities of, of what he could be for God. And he's talking about how he wants to get his uh, life figured out and do the right thing, etc., etc. And I felt led by the spirit to say, um, have you ever considered along um, and over and above these sanctification things that God is doing in life, maybe, maybe God has a possibility that he can use you and your relationship skills to bless and to equip, equip and to teach other people how to live. And what he said to me is, you know, people have said a lot of things to me and a lot of crazy things to me over the last years, but no one has ever said that. Imagine that you lived your whole life and no one ever told you or even brought up the idea and you never thought of that you had anything to offer to the people around you. Imagine if that was your life. That's horrible. Horrible. And it just blew his mind and he went away thinking. I said, I'm not going to say anything else. I'm going to spoil it. I'm just going to pray and uh, I'm going to say goodbye. But so he's beginning to think for the first time that maybe he has something to offer. And that's what happens when you use the gifts. We help people understand they have value, and we have value, and they have value, and we're called together to be the body of Christ for the people around us. And again, you guys are just incredibly uniquely gifted at welcoming people in regardless of their background. 
So this is, this is the final section here. There's, there's two sections to this. Um, this leads up to verse, I think it's 13 or 14. And there's so many great things in here. This is really one of these texts you've got to meditate on it because it, it just covers really so much stuff. But I like these lines that I picked out of here. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Share with God's people in need. And then practice hospitality. Well, what does it mean to practice hospitality? As I looked at this passage, I think really hospitality is the foundation. It's the thing that runs through every other gift. You don't have to think about it that way, but this morning, I think it's helpful to think about this that way. If you're going to do leadership, you're going to invite people into your life that you're going to lead. If you're going to do prophecy, it's a bit weird. If you're going to speak into people's lives, you're going to invite people into your life and to interact with them. If you're going to do serving, you're definitely going to be hospitable. If you're going to encourage people, you're definitely going to invite people into your life to encourage them. Hospitable basically means letting people into your life so you can serve them. And that's where I'm going to turn this thing around because it's not only community, it's hospitality that we're called to do as the body of Christ. So how do we do this? Just hit me with the next slide there, Linda. Well, it's supposed to be a plank anyway. I just have it written up. Uh, set it up so you can see it. All right, so how do we practice hospitality? What's the first point there? So on Sunday morning, first of all, on Sunday morning, you guys are doing an amazing job. Um, this is, uh, I think, it's just beautiful to see how so many of you have stepped out in faith to talk to people who are visiting on Sunday morning. And that's why uh, on Sunday morning I do my best to explain terms like hospitality and sanctification. That's why we sort of explain every movement of scripture. That's why we have coffee and bagel bits and why we come early and make that stuff. And uh, really that's what we're called to do. And this week, totally unplanned, uh, the Sunday school class at Vince, Cynthia leads, um, they've taken a week of, a month of serving and they're going to be serving. So we're trying to teach this to our kids. But Sunday morning obviously is a great time to practice hospitality. As individuals and families, that's incredibly important too, to practice hospitality as individuals and families. So I'm going to talk, I'm talking about this as a church, but the fact of the matter is that you can go home and practice hospitality right away. You can invite people into your life in ways that um, are as simple as saying hi to the person in the line next to you at the grocery store. Maybe it's as simple as saying, hey, do you got time to go out for coffee? Some of you are good at texting. Sometimes it's just as easy to send a text to someone and say, hey, thinking about you today. It's simply inviting people into your life as individuals and families. The third one here is systemically. So a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the work that the elders talk about at their council meetings is this issue. How do we be systemically hospitable as a church. Because it's not just sort of our interactions, it's how we're set up and how we're designed as a church to be um, welcoming and to be hospitable. And I think there's, um, there's been some developments over the last, I think, three years, and this is one of the things that's developed. So a lot of churches have small groups where we're sort of organized to be small groups and you meet for a year and then you stop meeting. And that's a great thing. Some of you are in those groups from years ago. Some of you have been in those groups. Um, but what we've been tracking towards is something a little bit more like intentional community. And we talked about missional communities and then um, we sort of moved on from that experiment to an experiment we're calling Life Together Groups. And the simple idea of a Life Together Group is, um, well, first of all, it's written up in that handout in your bulletin. But the simple idea is that we want to do life together. And so over the last uh, school year, I mean, from the time uh, school started, there's been three groups that have been meeting. And the only reason we haven't done more than three groups is because we haven't had people to lead more than three, uh, three groups. And so our hope is that in the next four or five years that this really develops and becomes part of the DNA of Calvary Church that we would sort of have a church that not only meets on Sunday, but that would be part, we all would be part of these groups that do life together. And uh, so there's been three groups of people, and there's a presentation afterwards, after church, to sort of introduce people more fully to that. And if you're interested in being a leader of one of those groups, or if you're interested in just learning more about what that means, I'd invite you to go to that and participate in that. But here's what happens as a church normally. People come to church, and they visit, and we say hi to them for the first five or six, seven weeks, 
And then after about six or seven weeks, we kind of move on and say hi to other people. And people come in the front door and eventually go out the back door. But what people are looking for, what people need is hospitality. They need community. I need it. You need it. And the text says to practice it. And that's the last point really here. It's practice hospitality. So how do you get better at practicing hospitality? Some of us are naturally really outgoing, and we just sort of talk to people all the time. And some of us really don't have a lot of inclination to talk to new people. We don't know what to say. But the text actually says practice. It doesn't say be really good at hospitality. It says practice. I mean, I know it's, it, what that means is it says do it. But it says practice. And I think that's a helpful term when you think about hospitality. How do you be hospitable? Well, you practice. You don't have to be perfect at it. You simply have to practice. And so this morning I made this, uh, this house. I guess I've been on vacation for a while, so I had uh, lots of energy to make lots of illustrations this morning. Um, but this is a cardboard house. I just picked up a piece of cardboard or a box at Garrett's and made it into a little house. We did this before as a family. And there's even lights in there. We taped up some flashlights. And uh, it's a lot of fun as kids to play in a house like this. But I have it as an illustration this morning, as an illustration of really of what a lot of us have to offer in the area of hospitality. When we think about hospitality, we often think, well, I'm not going to invite people over to my house because it's a mess, and those people who do that are really gifted at putting all the food out just right, and they're really good at that. And maybe all of us aren't good at that. Maybe all of us don't have the incredible spiritual gift of hospitality. And we look at what we have to offer, and we think in our minds, we won't say this, but we think in our minds, really what I have to offer is kind of like a cardboard house that I taped together with duct tape and some other kind of black tape here. But hear my heart here. God has created you with very particular gifts and experiences with points of pain, with points of victory, with points of opportunity that God has brought into your life. And all of that works together in such a way that he's created you to be someone that someone else needs in their life. That's what he's called us to be. So I was thinking about hospitality and community. And what, what's happening right now is that I'm experiencing something that is a little bit um, awkward for me. When I first came here the first couple of years, I could sort of interact with everybody new and everybody here in really often meaningful and ways that took a lot of time, but it was really good. And over the last year, I've noticed more and more that I don't have enough time to interact with everybody that's visiting church, both on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, food truck, coffee spot. I'm simply running out of time. And it's difficult for me because people call and I can't get back to them as soon as I want to. And, and I still have to do the worship stuff and the administrative stuff, which I love doing. I love doing it all, so I try to do it all. But it just, it just doesn't work. And so there really is two points. First of all, I'm really grateful that God has made you a hospitable people too. And I'm really grateful for the elders and deacons who have stepped up and uh, just done amazing things out of their own heart. I'm really grateful for the coffee spot that God has done far more than we ever could have asked or imagined with that. I'm grateful for those of you who on your own initiative simply go out and talk to people and welcome people and the life groups that really came out of nowhere in terms of the leadership that's filling that up and, and for Matt for leading that and writing that thing up that's in your bulletin. And, and it, God has just done amazing things. But more and more as we uh, function and live as a church, it's our call as a church to be hospitable. There's 30,000 people in Wyoming that don't go to church and don't believe in Jesus. We probably are never going to get the chance to be hospitable to every single one of those. But what if God would bring 200 people through our doors in the next year and that, that actually happens already? What if God would bring 300 people? What if God would bring 1,000? There's no way that I and the elders and even the people that help on the coffee spot would ever be able to interact with that many people. But if we as a church understand that our call is to be a church that is, understands the power of hospitality and engages in the hospitality, and then teach people that come here that this is actually part of our DNA and this is what we do because it's really important, I think God will use us and equip us as a church to reach more and more people and usher them into the presence of Jesus Christ. So the question I have this morning is, how is God calling you to be hospitable? It might be big. 
It probably is in some very small ways. It might be just at school talking to that person that no one ever talks to. It might be at work sending that email to the person who you really don't get along with that well, but you just want to offer them some, some grace, some peace, some kind words, some helpful words. It might be the person at the nursing home who lives down two doors from you and really doesn't ever have anybody over and you can just have a cup of tea with them at some point. I don't know what it is. But I'd like to invite you to consider and to pray this morning how you, equipped in unique ways by the gifts that God has given you, can step out in faith and practice practice hospitality. Let's pray. Father God, your word speaks. And you tell us directly that we are all unique members of the body of Christ. Some of us have been given the gift of leadership. Some of us have been given the gift of hospitality. Some of us have been given the gift of mercy. Some of us have been given the gift of serving, of giving. But I pray that you'd speak to us and let us know where we are gifted. And this morning, I invite you to speak to our hearts and help us know where you're calling us in this area of hospitality. Thank you that when we step out in faith, we see your presence and we see your action in entirely new and amazing ways. And I pray that you'd help each one of us by your spirit to do what you're calling us to do this morning. And then lastly, Lord, some of us here this morning need some hospitality. We're hurting and we're broken and we need your help, Lord. And I pray this morning that you would give us your hospitality that you would help us as the church be hospitable to those people here this morning who need it, that we'd come around them in prayer, that we'd support each other in mercy, we'd support each other in love, and we'd be a church where people can truly find grace in their time of need and hospitality for the things in their life. Lord, I pray that more and more this plank of hospitality be part of the foundation, part of the DNA of Calvary Church. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.